Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 11 through 23. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Soon afterwards, he, Jesus, went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her, and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. How is it that John the Baptist could have been confused about the identity of Jesus? After all, the Gospel of John has told us that John the Baptist testified the following about Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 29 to 35, before Jesus had called the first of his disciples, so long before this moment. Text says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. And beyond even this, the Gospel of Luke has told us that John's mother Elizabeth and Jesus' mother Mary were cousins who were pregnant at the same time and had met and discussed the prophecies regarding their children. On that occasion, Luke has told us that John recognized Jesus while he was still in his mother's womb. Luke has recollected the following in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, how is it that John the Baptist could have been confused about who Jesus was? Dr. Grant Osborne has suggested the following possible responses to that question in his commentary Luke verse by verse. He writes, Some think this is due to John's imprisonment. If Jesus had indeed come to free the prisoners, why is John still languishing in prison? Others think John's doubts are due to the lengthy amount of time with little progress. He wants Jesus to act more decisively. A third possibility is that Jesus, in his positive ministry of performing miracles, did not fit the kind of Messiah John was expecting, one who would bring God's judgment on the apostate nation and pagan world. That's the end of the quotation. Now, if we were to go on, Dr. Osborne has found the third of these options to be the most likely. And to a degree, I agree with him, though maybe for slightly different reasons than he articulates. The timber of John's message and that of Jesus, to this point in the Gospel, are quite different. We may recall that John's message was full of warning and threat. Luke has summarized it in Luke chapter 3 verses 7 to 9 as follows. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
To this point in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' ministry has not been characterized by the sorts of things about which John had warned. Beginning in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, we've been told that Jesus has become known as a prolific teacher, an exorcist, and a healer of diseases. Like John, he has run afoul of the governing authorities, but for different reasons. John's conflicts were because of the intensity of his calls for faithfulness to the law of Moses and to holiness of heart and life. Jesus' conflicts were different. John had been arrested by King Herod for accusing Herod of breaking the law of Moses' prohibition against adultery by marrying his brother's wife. Jesus, however, was run out of Nazareth because he suggested that during times of judgment, God had sometimes shown more mercy to Gentiles than to his own people. It's different. Whereas John had warned that God would not forgive the sins of those who go on sinning, Jesus himself had forgiven sins unilaterally on his own authority. Whereas John had called the people to obey the law of Moses strictly, Jesus had seemingly been playing fast and loose with the contemporary Jewish understanding of Sabbath law. Whereas John and his disciples fasted regularly out of a spirit of repentance, Jesus and his disciples did not fast. Instead, they ate and drank freely, sometimes even with tax collectors and sinners. Whereas John had warned the people that God would destroy those who did not bear fruit in keeping with repentance, Jesus had been teaching his disciples to love their enemies and do good to those who hate them, focusing more on the mercy of God than of his impending judgment. And whereas John had warned that death was coming on the disobedient, Jesus had just raised a widow's son from the dead. According to Luke chapter 7 verse 18, it was after the disciples of John reported all these things to him, that John sent them to ask Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? I suspect that John was, in the words of the Apostle John, testing the spirits to see if they were from God. And from John's vantage point, the message God had committed to him, and the message that Jesus was preaching and embodying, were incompatible. If I had to paraphrase John's question to Jesus, it would sound something like this. I was certain you were the one for whom I had been sent to prepare the way, but you seemed to be rejecting the message I was sent to preach. Was I wrong about you? Are our messages compatible? Have I prepared the way ahead of you, or was my ministry preparing the way for another? Now, had John lived longer than he did, he would have witnessed many of the themes of his message arising in the life and ministry of Jesus. We'll bear witness to these developments as the gospel proceeds. But at this point, we're still early in the ministry of Jesus. And so Jesus responded to John's question as follows in Luke chapter 7, verses 22 to 23. And he answered the messengers of John, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. What has Jesus communicated to John? How has Jesus answered John's question in this response? I suspect that the final miracle in this chapter of Jesus' ministry in Luke, the raising of the widow's son at Nain, is essential to understanding Jesus' response to John. And to all who would ask Jesus, are you the one for whom we have been waiting, or is there another? Now, though the Gospel of John tells us that John denied being the prophet Elijah when directly questioned in John chapter 1, verse 21, John's response in that context was likely a denial that he was literally Elijah returned from the heavens, where he had been taken bodily by chariots and horses of fire, as we might recall from the book of 2 Kings. In the Gospel of Luke, however, John has been unequivocally connected with the prophecy of Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, which mentions Elijah and reads as follows, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. In the telling of Luke, the angel who appeared to John's father, Zechariah, had said the following about John in Luke chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. 
he will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah he will go before him, to turn the hearts of parents to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Though both their messages and their examples seemed inconsistent at this point in Jesus' ministry, Jesus called on John's commission as the Elijah who was to come to help him to understand why Jesus had begun his ministry as he had. The prophet for whom Elijah historically had prepared the way was the prophet Elisha. Elisha began as Elijah's servant. We can find the story of his commissioning in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. When Elisha first began to serve Elijah, Elijah had already been long embroiled with a prophetic conflict with the northern Israelite king Ahab and his wife Jezebel, not unlike the later conflict between John the Baptist and King Herod. Elijah's ministry had been aggressive and difficult. He had been called to chastise the king, condemn the people for their idolatrous worship of Baal and Ashtoreth, and even to slaughter the priests of Baal personally. In many ways, Elijah's ministry of repentance and that of John the Baptist were of a kind. Elisha, however, did not begin his ministry as Elijah had. After God transported Elijah directly into the heavens, Elisha did not continue in the adversarial ministry of Elijah right away. Instead, Elisha went to Jericho, and he began to live and work amongst the people. His ministry begins in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 and following. His first prophetic act was to purify the city's tainted water supply. His second prophetic act was more violent. He was accosted by a gang of young people, and in response he called upon bears to protect him. The bears killed the gang of young men. And this is a violent episode, but it's akin to Jesus driving out of demons early in the Gospel of Luke. After this, Elisha continues as a dispenser of God's mercy. He went on to make a positive prophecy with respect to the current king of Israel, despite his continued wickedness in the direction of his father. He continued to deliver an impoverished family from starvation by miraculously providing them with enough oil on which not only to live, but also to prosper further by being able to sell the excess. And he proceeded to have compassion on this woman even further, by asking God to provide her a child in her old age, which God did. Then, after an unspecified number of years, when the child was older, he developed a severe headache which resulted in his death. And when Elisha heard about this development, he was greatly distressed and wanted to send his servant to raise the child from the dead, much as Jesus had healed the centurion's servant at a distance. However, the mother resisted and begged Elisha to come himself, so he came. 2 Kings continues the story as follows. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and closed the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got up on the bed and lay upon the child, putting his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And while he lay bent over him, the flesh of the child became warm. He got down, walked once to and fro in the room, then got up again and bent over him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called her. When she came to him, he said, Take your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she took her son and left. What does this have to do with Jesus, John the Baptist, and the raising of the widow's son at Nain? This miracle in the days of Elisha occurred in a town called Shunam. In Shunam, is only a stone's throw away from the town of Nain, in which Jesus raised the son of another widow. And as had been true of Elisha, Jesus raised the son of the widow, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 7, verse 13, out of compassion. From here, the prophet Elisha would proceed to miraculously purify poisoned stew for a company of prophets. He would miraculously feed 100 men with only 20 loaves of barley. He would heal the commander of an enemy nation of leprosy, and he would miraculously raise a sunken axe head from a river for another company of prophets who were gathering wood. It's not until 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8 that Elisha would return deliberately to the political arena, but even then he was never as aggressively or directly involved as had been Elijah. In fact, by the time of Elisha's death, 
he was on better terms with the king of Israel than Elijah had ever been. Elijah's ministry had been characterized by speaking truth to power and enduring never-ending conflict with compromised people in positions of power. Elisha's ministry, however, was more characterized by dispensing God's mercy on the poor and the powerless. Elisha, too, spoke truth to power, but he was rarely in the midst of the action. If Elijah's ministry was to call the authorities to holiness, Elisha's ministry had been to live righteously in spite of the wickedness of one's king or country. This is the heart of Jesus' response to John. John had been called to proclaim God's call to repentance. Jesus had come to demonstrate the kind of God who called his people to repent. The challenge in the days of Elijah and Elisha was that the people had become convinced that Baal was a more gracious God than Yahweh, the God of Israel. Because Israel's kings were wicked, few in living memory could remember being cared for by God. The First Testament suggests, over and over again, that the people turned to Baal and Ashtoreth and other false gods in part because the requirements of these gods were less stringent and they were more compatible with natural human desires. In other words, Baal was easier to please, and since he was a false god, he was also less apt to punish the people if they strayed even from his worship. In the ministry of Elijah, God condemned Israel for this idolatry. In the ministry of Elisha, God demonstrated the kind of care he had promised to provide and the kind of care he was offering again if the people would repent. Something similar was happening in the ministries of John and of Jesus. In John, as in Elijah, God was calling the people of Israel to repent and return to the way of life by bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Jesus began his ministry, as had Elisha, by demonstrating what kind of care God was willing to provide for those who truly became citizens of his kingdom. In the words of Jesus in Luke 7, 22-23 again, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. In other words, Jesus was telling John that their ministries and messages were as compatible as those of Elijah and Elisha. As John had been commissioned to declare, and as God had said of himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 34 verse 7b, Yet by no means am I a God who will clear the guilty, but visit visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And yet, as Jesus had been demonstrating, the God who calls his people to repentance is a God who is, in the words God spoke to Moses just a bit earlier in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 to 7, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's how God's revelation to Moses began. It continued with what was essentially John's ministry, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents and so on. But Jesus began with the beginning, a God merciful and gracious. To put the messages of John and Jesus together, as they had been originally declared in unison by God to Moses at Mount Sinai, we must repent because God is just and will not leave the guilty unpunished. But we can repent because this same God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, and is willing to forgive our iniquity, transgression, and sin. What Jesus was explaining to John is that repentance is useless with an indifferent God, or with a God who is more interested in justice than in mercy. As David had recognized long ago in his Psalm of Repentance in Psalm chapter 51 verse 1, he wrote, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy blot out my transgressions. John had prepared the way for Jesus by declaring God's intention to judge the nations of the earth and God's promise not to leave the guilty unpunished drove John's message 
But Jesus had prepared the way for that repentance by insisting that the God who called his people to repent was a God who was eager to forgive and willing to restore. As God had long before declared through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 30 to 32, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. That was the ministry of John. But here's the ministry of Jesus as we continue with Ezekiel. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. We don't know if John the Baptist came to understand Jesus' response, but we must labor to understand him. To summarize the ministries of John and Jesus taken together, we must repent because judgment is coming and God will not leave the guilty unpunished. But more than that, we can repent because our God is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. May those who have ears to hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen.